Yeah, it's all in. It's a nice campus. Yeah, I did mine right there. Yeah. I took a couple. There you go. Yep. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Ole Valley School District Board of Directors regular meeting for February 16, 2022. Roll call, please. Pollock? Here. Heckman? Here. Piper? Yep. Backhand? Yep. Jackson? Here. Keller? Here. Markley? Here. Perry? Here. Second? Here. Thank you all to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I'd like to announce at this time that we have no plans for an executive session. However, should the need arise, we'll, we'll uh, handle it at that time. Uh, school program, Dr. Shane. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. Tonight we have uh, two school programs for this evening. The first, uh, we have our school board representatives with us this evening. Turn it over to the ladies for the building updates. Hi, I'll be reading the school board report for the elementary school. On Friday, January 28th, the elementary school celebrated Pause Friday. Pause Friday takes place on the last Friday of each month as part of, of the EVIS program. On these days, there is a time set aside at the end of the day to provide a positive school-wide activity. The last Friday in January, students received booster lessons on expectations in the school hallways and cafeteria. Students then received classroom or grade level incentives. The Pause Friday activity for February is a school-wide movie. Congratulations to the following fifth grade students, Grayson Hogan, Court Piper, and Evan Murray, who competed in the Invention Convention held at the Hershey Hotel. The students were tasked with creating an invention to address a problem. The students came up with the chair lock. The chair lock is guaranteed to keep students' chairs from slipping out from underneath them. The students competed at the county level before earning the right to compete at the state level. The chair lock team were part of 66 students out of a thousand that earned the right to compete at the state level. Great job to the Chairlock team and thank you to Ms. Gardecki for providing this opportunity for the students through her fifth grade science class. Elementary students and staff celebrated the 100th day of school on Thursday, February 3rd. Students and staff dressed as their older selves to celebrate being 100 days smarter. The elementary school collected canned goods for local food banks during the Super Bowl food drive. Students voted for their favorite Super Bowl team by placing canned goods in the appropriate team's box. The majority of the elementary students were rooting for the Cincinnati Bengals. The elementary school is participating in the Trout in the Classroom program sponsored by Pennsylvania Trout Unlimited and Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. The program allows students to learn about the life cycle of rainbow trout. Trout eggs were delivered on February 8th, and there are approximately 155 live eggs. The trout will grow in a 55-gallon tank under the watchful eyes of Mrs. Seigel, Ms. Gardecki, and the fifth grade students. The trout will be released in a local stream sometime in May. OVES attended early intervention meetings on Friday, February 11th. The meetings provide families the opportunity to meet and collaborate with staff from the elementary school in preparation for kindergarten. Kindergarten registration in full. Information has been sent out to families in the school district for the 2022 and 2023 school year. Families will have the opportunity to visit the elementary school for a registration session on either April 5th or 6th. We look forward to meeting the new school. And now the middle school. Congratulations to our January students of the month. In sixth grade, Brianna Patterson and Wilson Stroop. In seventh grade, Anthony Garlic Foley and Jenna Hoffman. And in eighth grade, just Jessica Selecki and Brian Markowski. On Tuesday, January 25th, all eighth grade students took part in our Spark High School and Career Preparation Activities. This included a presentation by the high school counselors about course selection and options. High school Paul students interacted with their eighth graders supervising multiple activities. Thanks for a job well done. Congratulations to the following inventors for being selected Pennsylvania Invention Convention finalists. Andrew Hawes created a prototype of his invention, the Safe Slicer. Julie Baum and Allison Wolf used the 3D printer to make a model of their automatic shower. 
Mr. Noya, health and phys ed teacher at OVMS on February 8th, began a weightlifting and fitness program for students after school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Interest has been high with over 50 students participating. On Friday, February 11th, the middle school sponsored a Valentine's Day dance from 6 to 8 p.m. in the cafeteria. The event was a huge success with over, over 200 students in attendance. We expanded our school-wide positive behavior program this year. During the month of February, we conducted class meetings to review our Lynx Pride chart matrix with students. Incentives and other events will be coordinated with students and staff to define, encourage, and promote their expectations. Thursday, February 17th is a random act of kindness day. Students are able to earn pride points through random acts of kindness to fellow classmates, teachers, and staff. Teachers will provide a a prized golden ticket when the students are observed showing random acts of kindness. The BTSO is sponsoring a Slugfest Pencil Sandwich Sale fundraiser to support activities, field trips, etc. for OVMS students. The sale will be conducted between now and February 26th. We appreciate the involvement of our BTSO as they continue to support the students in the middle school. Thank you. I'll be reading the high school board for tonight. The high school is already planning for next year. In January, the high school had its annual course selection night where teachers created videos for each course meant taught. Parents and students were able to review the videos in advance of the live virtual question and answer session with teachers representing each department. Guidance counselors, along with POS web members, visited the middle school, spoke to eighth graders about high school scheduling options, and participated in activities to help acclimate them to high school. In addition, the counselors met with each 9th through 11th grade student to help them schedule according to their goals and future plans. Finally, counselors continued to write letters of recommendation and provide colleges and opportunities and universities with senior updates. Many of our students continue to be recognized for their achievements. Congratulations to our FFA students, Wesley Hoffman, Elena Aerosmith, Leah Walters, Bailey Hornig, John Almendinger, and Natalie Baum for placing in Creed, and Allison Riley, Addison Aerosmith, Lily Hetrick, Kendall Rohrbach, Jacob Mowry, and Rebecca Berger for placing an interview. Congratulations to Addie Aerosmith for being named Rotary Student of the Month. Last but not least, congratulations to Charlotte Fisher for winning the regional level of Poetry Out Loud and her advancement to the state competition. Over 200 students from nine career and technology and technical centers competed at the Skills USA District 4 competition on January 21st at BCTC's East and West campuses. Competitions range from presentations, written tests, and hands-on skills. 23 BCTC students place in the top three of their competition. First place students will be advancing, advancing to the State Skills USA competition in April, 2022. Oli had two first place winners, Nathaniel Widener for Motorcycle Service Technology, Recreational and Power Equipment Technology and Bradley Arnold for collision repair technology, auto collision repair technology. BCTC will be offering a career camp June 13th to 17th, 2022 to current sixth through eighth grade students. Campers will spend the week in a unique learning experience focused on fun, creativity, and hands-on activities. Our winter teams are starting to wrap up their season and our spring teams will be starting their season in early March. Our cheerleaders took 14th at the PIAA state championship competition our boys basketball team has qualified for districts, which start the week of February 21st. Our girls basketball just missed out on a district three playoff berth. Our bowlers are competing at the BCIAA individual tournament this week, and our wrestlers will be attending the district three sectional tournament this coming Saturday. A special congratulations goes out to senior basketball player, Danny Tierchi, who has now scored over a thousand career points, joining only eight other former basketball players to achieve this career milestone at Ole Valley. Thank you. Uh, next presentation this evening is um, updates for our FFA group. Mr. Dyson. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off by just doing a few introductions and then I'm going to turn it over to our student. Um, I am Mrs. Casey Wright, uh, one of our egg teachers and FFA advisors. Um, behind me is Mr. Jeremy Deicher, another ag teacher and advisor for our program here at the Ole Valley. I also want to take a moment to introduce 
Um, Ms. Lauren McHenry over there, she is a student teacher serving with us this year uh, in her final semester uh, before entering hopefully into service as a, a future ag teacher, um, and she's completing her program at Penn State University. And then we have with us our 2021 and 2022 FFA officers. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our chapter president, Addison Aerosmith, to continue the rest of their presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Rice. Hello, everyone. We are very thankful for the opportunity to present here tonight. Unfortunately, we were unable to present last year due to COVID-19. However, we are excited to be here showing everyone just a part of what we do all year round. We are extremely lucky to have the support from each one of you and the community, which allows us to take part in these events during times as chaotic as these past two years. I would now like to introduce this year's officer team. Starting out with our chapter vice president, Kendall Rohrbach. Chapter secretary, Allison Riley. <laughs> chapter treasurer, Jacob Mowry. <laughs> chapter sentinel, Bradley Arnold. Chapter chaplain, Nicholas Golden. Chapter Historian, Sarah Berger. Chapter Reporter, Lillian Hetrick. And Chapter Student Advisor, Jay Howe. So without further ado, I would like to pass things along to our Chapter Sentinel, Bradley. Starting back with the summer of 2020, we were able to achieve very much while dealing with the COVID-19 restrictions. A great deal of that is because of Scott Blatt. He's always very helpful and willing to teach us a thing or two. Scott showed us how to properly pressure wash our greenhouse and helped us moving many things like our lemon trees. We were also very fortunate enough to still have our annual fish fry, where we harvest the fish we raised all year and then enjoy different ways of consuming them. New courses to the Ag program are both BATEC A and B. Both classes have been taken by many students, both FFA and non-FFA. In the room, we have dog grooming equipment where we are able to have the pets brought in and go through the process of washing and grooming them. There are cages where our pet guinea pig lives and where we can put other pets that students volunteer to bring in. This year, an interesting pet we have stayed with us for about a week were chinchillas. We also received a grant for an ultrasound machine and we have used it on pregnant dogs and sheep so far. A major piece of equipment in the room is the exam table where we put the animals to examine them, clip their nails, and look at their eyes and ears. The American degree is the highest award presented nationally to an FFA member. To apply for, this, to apply for the American degree, a member must have received the Keystone degree from their state, completed a minimum of 50 hours of community service, been an active member for at least three years, have graduated at least 12 months to which the award would be given, and earn at least $10,000 or worked at least 2,250 hours. During the 2020 Virtual National FFA Convention, we had two former members receive this award, Hayden Golden and Oliver Prout. Even with COVID, our chapter was able to stay involved with virtual public speaking events. January 29th, 2021, a few of our members participated in virtual employment skills and create speaking LDEs. The members who participated in employment skills had to create a resume, cover letter, fill out an application, and go through a virtual mock interview. Creed participants had to recite the FFA creed in front of a small panel of judges over Zoom. On February 26, 2021, we had six members participate in junior prepared public speaking. Students of Bob prepared a three to five minute long speech in advance of the contest and presented it to a judges virtually. Our members excelled in public speaking events despite it being virtual. 2021 FFA week was a huge success. We had a lot of participation from FFA members and non-FFA members that participated in theme days and the food drive to support local businesses. Many of our members also participated in delivering apples and mushrooms as appreciation to our teachers and in the to-go style faculty breakfast. Ag Literacy Week is held over three days in the middle of March. 
During those three days, we go down to the elementary school and read agriculture related books to kindergarten, first and second graders. The books are provided by the PA Farm Bureau and educates them on how important agriculture is. Members then also do a fun activity with the students related to the book. We had our first annual Easter party on March 26, 2021. As an alternative to our usual Halloween party since we could not have that event due to COVID in the fall. We had different games to play, an egg hunt, and good food to eat. Members enjoyed being able to have an in-person activity for a change. Last year's fish fry was held on May 26. Throughout the year, the animal science class raises the tilapia up to a market weight of two pounds. Tilapia are weighed each month, while our environmental science classes do water quality tests, testing for things like ammonia, nitrogen, nitrate, and pH levels. Once the fish are up to market weight, we are able to learn the process of purging, filleting, and finally frying, grilling, and baking. The annual Pennsylvania State Convention is a three-day event normally held at State College at University Park. Here, students can choose to be on a team or compete individually, depending upon the competition. Due to COVID-19, there were changes around the event itself. However, students across PA were still able to compete virtually. Contests were held throughout the month of May. Some highlights from our members include our food science team placing first with Grace Prout placing first individually and Benno Widener placing second. Then several of our members excelled in other contests like Lily and the Junior Prepared, Jacob in Creed Speaking, and Emily in the FFA Knowledge CDE. During this past summer, our chapter entered displays in the Cutstown Allentown Fairs. We had our bee board about the conservation of bees and our fire board about wildfires. Some of the members also did individual competitions such as produce, flowers, displays, and fish tanks. This year in Allentown is also our first time entering a hardscape display, which should also place first. The summer of 2021 was a great summer for maintenance work. Members planted, we did a landscape around the high school. We also had many animals to take care of, such as our ducks, guinea pig, and all the fish. Our raised beds continue to be very productive, where we grow plenty of vegetables for the Holy Valley Food Pantry. This past October, a few of our members were finally able to return to the national convention held in Indianapolis, Indiana. After winning the state competition, our food science team was able to compete at the national level where they earned a bronze medal. Paige Rohrbach was also able to receive her American degree, which as Sarah mentioned previously, is the highest honor awarded nationally to FFA members. Looking ahead in the future, we have already scheduled our chapter trip to the national convention for 2022. On January 10th, our chapter visited the PA Farm Show. The students were allowed to explore the Farm Show Center and learn more about agriculture while also enjoying the food. We also entered two displays. One display was a landscape display organized by our members. The theme was down on the farm and that received third place overall. We also entered a display about facts about wildfires and that was titled Burning Up Over Wildfires and that received fifth place overall. Every year at Midwinter Convention takes place during Farm Show. Nine of our members this year received their FFA jackets after writing a short essay about what the jacket means to them. Nigel Patches, Wesley Hoffman, Elena Aerosmith, Kate Yerger, Leah Walters, Robert Kowalski, John Almendinger, Natalie Baum, and Bailey Hornig all received their FFA jackets. We also had three members receive their Keystone degrees. The Keystone degree is the highest degree that an FFA member can receive from the Pennsylvania FFA Association. It is based on leadership, chapter involvement, community service, academic achievement, and a completion of an SAE with $1,000 invested or earned and has a minimum of 300 hours. Kendall Warbach, Addison Aerosmith, and Leah Sarah Berger all received their Keystone degrees. The Hoya Valley FFA Alumni Organization is made up of past members of the FFA chapter. Through the years, the alumni chapter has donated money towards national convention trips, quarterly jackets, and two senior scholarships for high school seniors. On October 22nd to October 23rd, 
they held the Haunted Walk at Pikeville. The Haunted Walk was a trail you could walk up and get scared by different volunteer groups. The alumni also held the barbecue cook-off at the Oli Valley Fairgrounds. This was their first year holding this event and it was a tremendous success. Both of these events are scheduled again for 2022. The alumni organization also elected new officers as of April last year. The new president is Hayden Golden, Vice President Kelsey Schlegel, Secretary Haley Weidman, Treasurer Jessica Aerosmith. Next week is National FFA Week, which is definitely one of our busiest times of the year. Throughout the week, we will have a variety of spirit days to try and involve the entire district in on the FFA fund. So first we have Moo Cow Monday, which is only if we are in school on Monday for President's Day, USA Tuesday, Western Wednesday and Hat Day, Camo Thursday and Blue and Gold Friday, where we encourage our FFA members to wear their chapter t-shirts. That Tuesday is also Teacher Appreciation Day, where a bunch of our members will take apples and mushrooms down to the entire district, um, all three schools, and we give them to the entire staff and administration. We are also holding a food drive, which we have a variety of teachers who volunteered and each teacher is assigned a box and anyone in the district can donate food or any items and you'll place your items into the box of the teacher that you want to see kiss the cow. The Thursday of FFA week is the day that the items are tallied and the day that the teacher that wins will kiss the cow. We also have our faculty breakfast, which is held that Friday from 630 to 830. All staff and administration are welcome to come enjoy a prepared breakfast. To end the week, we have our line dancing held at the Fair Center that will run from 7 to 10. And then the following week on Tuesday, we will have our Yellow House fundraiser. We normally use that as a starting to the week uh, for FFA week, but since they are no longer open on Mondays, we had to reschedule. And a percentage of the proceeds from that fundraiser will benefit our FFA chapter. We would like to thank the school board members, our administration, and all the faculty and staff of the Ole Valley School District for their continued support each year, allowing our students to experience such amazing events. We would now like to present each one of you with a token of our appreciation. There are mugs and keychains, as well as invitations to our upcoming FFA week breakfast at your seat. We hope to see all of you there, as well as Tuesday, March 1st at our Yellow House Hotel. Thank you, and are there any questions? Who's the front runner to kiss the cow right now? I think Mr. Snyder's up front. <laughs> that's, that's rather typical, isn't it? Of course it is. Which end of the cow is that? Right on the nose. <laughs> Great job. Thank you, guys. Okay, now's the time on the agenda when we move on to introduction of guests or public comment. I have uh, three cards tonight, so looks like we can take everybody. Um, let's go through the rules. This, this, um, again, as per our district policy 903, which is at the, at the entrance of the door there, uh, public comment is generally limited to 30 minutes. Each participant is limited to five minutes in duration. Each participant shall announce their name and township of residence. Please, uh, public participants may express their concerns over school operations and programs, but may not address complaints about school personnel or other persons. Uh, all comments shall be directed to the board only. A uh, participant may not yield his or her time to any other person. Campaigning for a political candidate is not permitted and defamatory, uncivil, harassing, or rude comments are unacceptable. So the first card I have is Jamie Freed. Jamie Freed, uh, Ruskin Matter Township. I believe that all decisions that are need to be made um, need to be made locally. And the closer you are to the problem, the better you have a better chance of solving that problem the most efficiently and long term. And um, so I want to congratulate the board. Over the last three months or so, We've had the most transparent conversation, the most education I've had since I've been attending these meetings based on questions I've already remembered. And what I've learned in that time is that there are some things the board can control and there are some things the board cannot control. And I think the number that right now we're using is 90% of the things that the board does not have control of what happens in a school district. 
lot of those things are not cited by people in this room or in this township or in this county. They're decided in Harrisburg and they're decided in DC. So my talking tonight really is to tell people that that 90% number can be changed. That 90% number can be changed if we get the right people doing the right jobs in those places, Harrisburg and DC. So if you're not already involved, please get involved in that. The reason I'm talking about this tonight is because just this week, something came up with affects my family greatly, which is based on a law that was not decided here, that was decided somewhere else. That now one of my kids who's in the school does not feel safe coming to school like they normally would on a weekly basis. Because there's nothing that we can do about this because this is the law. And now I'm stuck in this situation. I really can't talk any more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freed. Uh, next card is Candace Coral. Candace Coral, Pike Township. Um, there have been a few conversations on hiring, which again, just like Jamie said, I wanted to say we're very happy about seeing that transparency and having those items discussed. I wanted to reiterate uh, some of the things that I captured when we had those discussions at the board stated and correct me afterwards if I've uh, captured them incorrectly. The administration is fully responsible for choosing the candidates to hire in the school district. The board votes to approve the budget for the new hires and they do not deliberate on ability. Any outside affiliations like social media are not considered when hiring individuals, just the typical background check. And there are laws and policies that support those hiring decisions, which I'm not going to list here. Now, I submitted a right to know request for the following. Um, is there a teacher, student, a teacher administration, a student administration fraternization policy? Um, is there a teacher personal liability on pursued legal action policy or maybe possibly uh, the union contract? And is there a teacher and administration communications etiquette policy? I'm asking for this documentation because of the, the recent current events. In 2019, the school was sued for a defamation of a student and a parent regarding an email sent to the drama director, Stacey Lyons. In addition, three students believed to be suspended for discussing their opinion at a school board meeting against Ms. Lyons. She pled in court. She had the right to the freedom of speech. She fought her entire case around this, but still cost our school $100,000 in legal fees. Now, if we fast forward to today, Ms. Lyons' daughter, Kale Lyons, is currently spearheading a lawsuit against our board for invoking their right to freedom of speech. And a few of the members who signed the petition to remove these board members stated, we don't want to take any money from the children. So my question to them, to the board, is how much money are we willing to allow this family to take from our children before we say enough is enough? Isn't the board allowed the same First Amendment rights as Ms. Stacey Lyons without costing these children anymore? I'd also like to ask the board um, to assume liability of Ms. Lyons that it's covered under the CBA, is it? Um, is it covered under the union contract? And how much of the lawsuit was transferred to Ms. Lyons' liability or did Ole assume all of the debts for this teacher's actions? She's not a commissioned officer nor a board member, so I couldn't find anything that said that she was liable or we were liable for any of her actions against the students. If they're not, and, and if there's nothing there to protect ourselves from this event, is there something that we can do to protect ourselves in the future? So now we have a request to approve the hiring of Ms. Angela Birx for special education, and she was observed on Twitter making statements about destroying the agriculture industry, which was very ironic coming what we, we saw today. One can only propose that she does not stand for what Oli is, an agricultural community, and she referred to another comment as seems we are at the dying whiteness stage, then referred all affiliated with the GOP as those with Nazi Germany. Some of the board should also maybe similarly denounce their connection to such teachers as they find appropriate to do so when other board members make controversial statements exercising their First Amendment rights. We'd like to know as a community that you also don't stand with those statements. But I do ask the board to go ahead and approve Ms. Burex based on her abilities that have been approved by the administration and not to reject her because she is allowed the same right as the board members, as Ms. Lyons, her right to freedom of speech. But let's hope that she watched today at the Agriculture FFA students and that helped provide her a little bit of insight into what it is that we do here as in a community. I recommend to the board if these policies do not exist to consider adapting a policy for fraternization, communication etiquette, and social management. 
I recommend to the board to consider adapting a policy for student disciplinary action, creating a neutral evaluation and confirmation of punishment, removing personal perspection or perspective of the teachers and administration if it hasn't been done so already due to the cases that I've read. A lot of the previous lawsuit may have been avoided if there was a fair balance of what was considered to be a suspendable offense while also communicating to the parents appropriately. And I'm sure we can all look back and document a few lessons learned from that incident. Uh, thank you to the students again um, for the board representation of taking the time to address all kids' accomplishments. Um, some of the parents brought forward that there wasn't an uh, equal balance on accomplishments and recognition on social media. Um, there was a lot of talk about a child who made their 1,000th shot, but there wasn't enough uh, you know, accomplishments or recognition for other children that may have done something that was a little bit more academically driven. So I just ask that we keep in mind, we've made statements before that colleges aren't looking for GPA or high academics or just sports, but they're looking for a well-rounded individual, and we should forward all children the opportunity of having that type of stuff to put on their resumes. Um, and then lastly, something was brought to my attention about um, one of the events where a principal and a, a, pair, a teacher wanted to go to a conference, but we rejected um, funding a field trip. I was just asking if maybe we could, until we figured out what was going on with the lawsuit, if there was something going forward that we don't approve of any spending outside of what's necessary. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Coral. Uh, last card I have is, is it Mark Yorgi. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Mark Yorgi, Ruska Manor Township. Uh, my family has seen three generations uh, pass through the doors here at Olin. And uh, a question that uh, comes up from time to time is how would you describe the Oli Valley? The Reverend P.C. Kroll describes it this way in a book he wrote in 1926. And I quote, it has been indeed for over 200 years, which would now be almost 300 years, a boiling kettle of stirring life, a beehive of industrious activity, a bird's nest of worthy colonial family settlements, a cradle of religious agitations, a collegium of rudimentary and higher education, a center of important historic happenings, and a paradise of peaceful agricultural home life, end quote. So let's just look at one of those, uh, a beehive of industrious activity. This community is full of industrious activity. We have many, many diverse businesses within the Oli Valley. Just look at the listing of the businesses on the Oli Valley Business Association. And right here within our agricultural science programs, by the way, I didn't know that the uh, FFA would be speaking tonight, so I did not see the agenda. So my comments here for are, are, are very pure and out of the heart, and I did not know that they would be here. And right here within our agricultural science programs, we have outstanding industrious efforts to take our students into the 21st century with classes in food, plant, and animal sciences, just to name a few. These classes in turn help prepare students for future jobs in the ag industry, and food industry. And these advanced programs go far beyond the typical animal husbandry and plant management, land management of the farm. We are blessed to have someone like Jeremy Deicher as the advisor for the FFA to lead these students forward and at the same time to spur them into better leadership roles, which we saw this evening. It is very obvious. I'm biased about ag programs here at Oli. I was a student here and graduated in 66. But a few years earlier, I was challenged as I attended school, floundering a bit as a student. And Mr. Blank, the advisor, Carl Blank at that time, challenged me to step up. And he helped me to grow and mature as a student at that time. So one of the other comments that Pastor Kroll mentioned was a paradise of peaceful agricultural home life. What a beautiful word, picture of the Oli Valley. We have heard testimony numerous times from recent new residents discovering this area and relocating here. 
We have also heard of their children's positive educational experiences as they made their way to graduation. Yet this paradise of peaceful home life has been labeled in a previous school board meeting as a systematic racist setting. We're told that we are in need of radical remedial education to correct the problem. I listen respectfully, but I do not agree. I applaud the board for allowing the open dialogue on this matter and many others as you search out what is most important for the district. I am encouraged to see steps toward full explanation of processes and increased transparency. The school board's varied backgrounds, your education, your life experiences in total result in a diversity of thought, which is so very much valued as you discuss and debate what is most important for this school district. I understand the responsibility of the home to train and build up a child in the way he should go. From my vantage point as a grandfather, I'm a cheerleader now. I can encourage parents. And I encourage the board to consider placing wholesome guardrails within this valued education system here in Oli, so that we will do no harm to the children, to the students who are under your responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yorgi. Is there anybody online? If there's anybody online would like to speak to board, you can just uh, raise your hand on the, use your raise your hand function, I guess. Give me a second to see if anybody, I don't know how many people we even have online. I think sometimes people just come to the last second to the, so I just didn't so have to ask. Well, they have to, they have to announce it. I'll give anybody anyway, so. Okay, thanks everybody for your time this evening and your comments. Uh, moving on the agenda, Commonwealth funds. I have a motion to approve the Commonwealth funds report for January, 2022 as presented. Mrs. Atkins seconds that motion. Any questions or comments on the Commonwealth funds? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Uh, Piper. Yes. Backen. Yes. Beckman. Yes. Jackson. Yes. Keller. Yes. Markley. Yes. Perry. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Back in. Yeah. Motion approved. Treasurer's report. I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report for the month ending January 2022. Again, Mrs. Zakin, second that motion. Questions or comments on the treasurer's report? Roll call vote, please. Back in. Yes. Heckman? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Keller? Yes. Markley? Yes. Perry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Sackin? Yes. Piper? Yes. Motion approved. Approval of bills. I have a motion to approve, approve or ratify payment of bills for the period of January 15, 2022 through February 11, 2022, and the amounts as listed. Zach and seconds that motion. Any questions or comments on the bills? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Beckman? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Keller? Yes. Markley? Yes. Perry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Zakin? Yes. Pfeiffer? Yes. Zakin? Yes. Motion approved. Solicitor's report, Mr. Mancuso. No report this evening. Thank you, sir. Administrative report, Dr. Shank. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Just a reminder that Friday is a half day for students and the district is closed on Monday for President's Day. Thank you, Dr. Shank. Okay, moving on to committee reports, budget and finance, Mr. Uh, Dr. Markley. Thank you, Mr. President. I have one motion for action this evening to approve the budget transfers for the 2021-2022 school year as presented. Dr. Markley moves in motion number one. Mrs. Piper seconds that motion. Questions or comments on the budget transfers? We'll call no, vote. Same budget that we pretty much went over early in, correct? That's this year's this, this year's yeah, budget. So we're just moving money around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Just balancing it out. So just, just for the everybody sure. to understand. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, roll call vote, please. Jackson? Yes. Keller? Yes. Markley? Yes. Perry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Backin? Yes. Pfeiffer? Yes. Backin? Yes. Beckman? Yes. 
Uh, yes, motion approved. Sorry. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. No, I apologize. Uh, upcoming meeting is uh, next week, February 22nd at 6.30 p.m. That's at the budget final. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, personnel, Mr. Hickman. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Personnel has three uh, motions to see. I'd like to take each one individually. Motion one, to make a motion to approve Angela Brunex as a long-term sub-special ed teacher as assigned to the high school beginning February 22nd, 2022 through June 8, 2022. Uh, bachelor step one with benefits for the CBA. This is a prorated position. Uh, individual has a BS uh, in elementary and special ed uh, instructional one from Eastern University. And I believe we have received the, her uh, resume. Right. So Mr. Eckman, was a motion number one. Mr. Jackson seconds a motion. Questions or comments? Um, yeah, the, uh, Ms. Coral already brought it up and the information that I also forwarded to the rest of the board. Um, just I, just I, to I, caution you, we can't really, we can't discuss okay. the, the, the uh, okay. social well, media. Um, well, just I mean, if we want to, we can go into exec session. The if concerns, um, I guard teachers, not just academically, but they also um, have a higher standards because they're guidance in many ways to our children. So the concerns brought up here were really, you know, staggering and that just as a parallel to the relationship, if you're in a relationship with somebody, you can't look for anybody else, otherwise it's going to be cheating. So I don't want to see us putting ourselves in a position not to find a really good candidate for the job that will be here long term not just a short term. So do we have, what options do we have? Is there something that will have a temporary sub and uh, continue advertising for the position? Because we'd like to have, you know, somebody who is going to be here a good fit for many years to come. This is only through June, and then we re-advertise the position for a contract position for next fall. We've been advertising for this position since uh, December. Um, we've been advertising and interviewing. We did have somebody who um, we approved in January who was hired and then after the board meeting resigned immediately after the board meeting and then we re-advertised again and we cannot find anyone. Um, Mr. Mancuso um, can speak to the legalities of social media and First Amendment rights as to what we can and cannot use as far as you know, the boundaries between social media and, and employees. Now they cannot bring that into school setting long-term sub, if they choose to do that, then it's, you know, then you can be dismissed them more easily than you can a contract. But this person's employment does end on June 8th. It is not a permanent position where they would be returning next school year. That position would be reopened and we would be re-advertising for next school year. We uh, currently have no one in the in the position. Um, these children are do not currently have a teacher. It's rotating through different individuals at the moment as the person who uh, has resigned from that position has already moved on to their other employment. They were held up to the maximum length under the school code, which was 60 employment days. Um, so right now, these the students in that that are in her class, their caseload does not, they do not have a teacher at the moment. Fill in the rest, well, I mean, legally. What I, I will do. fill in the rest. Uh, social media posts, you can consider them. I'm not advising you to consider them because as everybody has their own points of view. However, those are public posts. Assuming they're her posts, I haven't, seen anything to that circumstance, but uh, you can consider public posts. I, I would like us to consider that we have a group of children who does not have a standard person with them right now. And if we don't hire this person now, they're going to continue to have, and we're looking at special education students that have nobody in that classroom with them on a regular basis to develop a relationship to have a curriculum, to have um, IEPs implemented, that I, I think we need to get somebody in there for the remainder of the year, open a post. I mean, if this person does a great job and wants to run for, and wants to apply for the position, great. We've seen what she's done for how many months. But I think we need to look at the children and what they need right now, and they need consistency, especially at a special ed level. Background checks, references were all excellent. And she's the only one that was available. Right. I mean, we've been interviewing and, and she's better than even some that came in second to the one who we hired and resigned. I mean, like we went back to the drawing board, those that we 
turned out. We had others that we've, you know, that were in the poll that um, we either did not show up for interviews or um, interviewed, and then we would not consider for a second. I mean, she she's a quality candidate. I mean, I can't speak to you know people have a right to post on their Twitter accounts their own their own views. There was nothing there that honestly could say some of our current people would have their own political views, but they didn't cross the line into where they wouldn't. If they bring that into the classroom and for, you know project that on the students, then we have an issue that we deal with as an employment issue. But they have their own right to have their, um, just as Ms. Coral had stated earlier, that they have the right to their political views. They do not have the right to push that on students. But they can say, it's kind of like I say to teachers, you can say what you want when you're in your car, but when you get out, you leave it in your car. It's kind of our kind of standard education thought. So she is a, essentially a long-term sub. She's a long-term sub. Mm -hmm. Just to get through the end of the year, we repost in April. Uh, when what we call the new crop comes out or teachers are thinking about moving to other districts. This is a really difficult, uh, sort of like Dr. Barkley pointed out at the committee meeting, um, we're talking about personnel. This is a very tough time of the year to hire. And even if you do try to hire someone who is in another district, they're going to be held 60 days. So you'd be looking at April until you even get somebody in that position. Um, and it's hard to get someone this time of year. And some of the nice thing sometimes is that people who don't have to work in education right now, Art working because this is not a fun time to be in education. Uh, coming off of COVID and a lot of the other things that educators are dealing with um, is that if you don't have to work, if you can take long-term subs and work where you want to and enjoy the job and then not have to work. Who's teaching these kids now though? Um, right now we are covering where we can and with anybody we can. And if we can get subs, which we don't have a lot of, um, we are. And if not, we're covering with personnel that we can. And it is not, I mean, like Mrs. Jackson said, it is not a good situation for our most vulnerable students. But if there is an issue, I can guarantee you that we will deal with it. I'm kind of known for that, so. And there is no guarantee of employment. Like any long-term sub, it doesn't matter where building they're in, a long-term sub under, you're not guaranteed employment. And if I can speak, please tell me, attorney, thank you so. But if there's an issue, then you're out of a job. In other words, she doesn't have first right of refusal. She basically would have to re, up, re, re yes. submit. Oh, yeah. If you have a long term, any of our long term right. subs, we anywhere in the district, if we have an opening, they apply, they go into the pool, they're interviewed, right. they run the process, you have to rise to the top. It's not a, a guaranteed, you know, guaranteed job. So long term subs are almost like contract employees. We're giving her a term of employment. That like makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's like That's a term position. Yeah. Right. Okay. She also has a very good person who's going to mentor her. Yes. Who knows what she's doing? Mm -hmm. Yes, that department at the high school is very strong in general. They're, they're a very good department. Any other questions? No. Okay, roll call vote, please. Keller? Yes. Markley? Yes. Perry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Zakin? Yes. Pfeiffer? Yes. Backin? Yes. Packman? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Motion approved. And tying in with that, uh, make motion two to approve Jennifer Bechtel as the mentor for Angela, uh, the compensation for the uh, CBA prorated. Mr. Hegman moves in motion two. Dr. Markey seconds that motion. Any questions or comments on uh, Ms. Bechtel as the mentor? Okay, roll call vote, please. Markley? Yes. Perry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Zakin? Yes. Pfeiffer? Yes. Backin? Yes. Beckman? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Keller? Yes. Motion approved. And motion three to approve the conference attendance of Jennifer Hoffman and Gina Finnerty to attend the International Science and Technology and Technology Education Live 2022 conference in New Orleans to present programs representing the Ole Valley School District on June 26th through the 29th, 2022. Cluster listed. Mr. Heckman moves in motion number three. Mrs. Jackson seconds that motion. Questions or comments on the trip? Yeah, I have some questions. Sure. Um, I just had a couple constituents reach out. They had some concerns over the, the but you know, using that those funds. Do we now? I know you said we didn't have any itinerary yet for that. Just trying to get an idea as far as what they're. Um, you know, they're going to be presenting the STEM program, which I'm full on for that. There's no doubt. Uh, I'm just kind of curious if we have an idea as far as what they're learning or what they're teaching down there. I can, I can, based on maybe, I know 2019, you said they were there. Yeah, I can give you what I can tell you what we did in 2019. We cannot go in 2023 due to some conflicts and personnel schedule or something, which is one of the reasons. We only go every, um, every three years we try to do it. 
But I can tell you coming out of the 2019 conference when we went, and it was about the same cost. Um, and I had sent a team and there you know, was no objections then. Um, and if you remember back, I don't know who was around, Dr. Markley, I know Mr. Heckman um, was around then. They used to go to model schools and send teams to model schools and they went to Atlanta and they went to Disney World and that was like in tens to $20,000 then. We kind of got away from that over the years and put the money into other things. And, and that was a choice that I had made. And we don't really do a lot of national conferences. We've done um, the Adam and Taj table. We've sent um, Jason Mole and, and Mr. Dyster to California. Um, we're probably, you'll see June coming also with our NASA partnership, which is part of our Earth Space Science STEM with um, Jeannie Bonham. You'll see that coming through. But just to give you an idea that when we went out at ISTE in 2019 and we came back, um, and Jenny Hoffman was one of the ones that had gone, and I forget who the administrator I sent that year was. But anyway, um, we came back um, and wrote over $100,000 worth of grants out of ideas and programs that we got out of just visiting ISTE. And uh, we did, weren't able to present that year. We got turned down because our academic programs were not rigorous enough. Um, and our ability to meet our lower end academic kids, our career academy kids who did your Christmas gifts that you saw and our block had. Um, and we also, um, out of that, were able to do our, um, we did a $25,000 grant for teacher training and development and technology that we wrote um, for our computer science framework. We got our tech ed teachers, which are our, basically our entire math department and uh, Mr. Buckner and the tech ed department trained and certified free in um, computer science education. And they're also certified by the state, which is a new certification that's coming out that it, everybody's gonna need to have, didn't cost you a dime. So we've actually written a more money than in grants than you're actually getting out of the ideas and working with the core companies and the programming and the ISTE and the, the global networking. It also kicked off our partnership with some of the schools in Ghana and Africa um, in our partner, Oli Valley partnership with those schools in which we're actually building um, STEM labs in Ghana and Africa and underprivileged schools um, to have that international connection. And um, we actually go back again in 23 next summer um, to, to develop that further, further. And you saw Jacob Mallory tonight, who's doing his SAE in Ghana and building wells and fresh water um, in those areas in where they don't have fresh water with uh, materials from that are basically um, trash and things that are available. And how do you build that, uh, which is phenomenal. And I'm hoping he'll do a presentation for you at some point on that. But out of that also, and I kind of like sketched it out and I know I talked too much, but we got all of our green screen technology, which you may have seen at the elementary and the middle school over the years and the kids are using extensively. We got our black cat, our cat. We got our, um, our, all of our grants for our 3D routers. We got our canvas for PD. We did our K -trek, K-12 tech teams, um, which are our building technology leaders. We did our ecosystem, which we have presented locally as well as the state level. We got back from P and, P and C um, about two weeks ago. Um, networked with some businesses there and saved over $25,000 and found a way not to update the Promethean boards at the elementary school and actually moving into an Apple TV version um, that saved you an over $25,000 in um, not having to update your equipment, but doing another way of uh, uh, doing the same thing that we're training the elementary teachers. They're kind of kicking and streaming a little bit right now, uh, but we'll get them trained over the spring and then the summer. Um, did not have to do that, which will make their lives easier in the long run and be more um, interactive for our students in project-based assessments. You'll save more money there. Um, our MakerBot 3D printing, which you saw with our Career Academy kids as we start our businesses, as we're calling them, in our three buildings and working with the Ole Valley Business Association as they're coming into our middle schools and elementaries. Um, we have our 3D printers. We have our sketchbooks and the art departments. They're all coming out of those. We have ceramic printers in all three buildings, which were purchased on grants. Those things saved you almost $20,000. That came out of ISTE in 2019. This ISTE conference is really on the project-based learning and what's called universal design, which I won't get into because it's too much curriculum stuff and that I, uh, I could talk for hours on that. But the other piece that's really in this ISTE conference is on the employability skills, which means our students that are either going to two-year schools, not the college bound, that, and we know that a lot of our students are either taking gap years or need to go in as Dr. Facken had brought up. And I was kind of like kind of cheering on the inside when you were bringing this up last month and again last week, because we have a lot of students who need to go into the trades and we've got to start to change our mindset about the trades. That is not a dumping ground. Votech is not a place where it's not the old school Votech. It is a career in technology education and it needs a higher ed. You need a two year degree or you need to go to uh, like 
med ed where you'll be trained and paid good money to be a lineman or you'll go to Mitsubishi and they will train you to work in the plant and pay you good money to get a career education and a college degree or they will pay you at Levance Manufacturing to learn CAD or RoboCAD <laughs> or you can go to RAC and then they will pay to send you to Bucknell or they will pay you to your college for to go to a four-year degree or our, which you proved last week on the, the pathway to the PA College of Health Science or a partnership that we're still working on, which I got to get to Pedro a little bit more, but on our partnership with Adia Stevens or Penn College of Technology, and you go there and make really good money um, on being HVAC or carpentry or some of the uh, electrician and have a job for life in, or healthcare and work anywhere in the world then not have to ever worry about healthcare and being unemployed and make more money than you will having a doctorate in education and a 20 years worth of student loans and then and, and be able to do that. I mean, I look at my what I, my little brother, he's not really little, two-year degree from Penn Tech and HVAC and makes two times the money I do, works half the hours, and has lived all over the world working on viruses at the Pentagon and like has been job for life, barely got out of high school. They basically graduated because my dad was board president and they didn't want to expel him. But, you know, and that's what he does. And my other brother's in carpentry and he makes more money and works less hours. And I have a doctor in education and work 80 hours a week. Like who is the smart one at the end of the day? So I'm like very into trades, but we've got to change the mindset. And part of this is the conference on a global level is where are the jobs in the next 10 years? So in, as you set up your pathway, which is why you must probably said why my I mean, this last 12 year vision has been mine and where we were going with where the STEM pathways and getting the reading immersion and the project based. But part of why we need to look at where we're going because the world that these kids are living in is a world that's unseen. But we need to get them to understand that we, they are living in a global world. So they need to understand that the jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of today. And then we want to get exposed to what that's going to be so we can get ahead of the curve and not live behind the curve so that we can get them ready and ahead of what's coming. And that's why the whole Earth space track is coming, even though we're two years behind because of COVID. But, you know, talking to some of the eighth grade parents, even last night at the meeting, you know, and you were there, we were talking about the whole marine biology and the astronomy and the astrophysics and some of that other stuff that's coming. That's going to be their world. You know, that's the world these guys are going to live in. So we need to get them prepared and what jobs go with that. Just as, and even whether they stay in Berks County and they're going to work at Carpenter or they're going to work at, at East Penn or they're going to, you know, go on to Mitsubishi or LeVans or some of the other corporations here in Berks County, or they go on to life beyond Berks County, we need to get them ready for that. But we also need to see what's happening outside of the United States. Because having studied in Europe and having studied in other places, like we got to look beyond the borders of Pennsylvania. We need to look beyond the borders of the United States education system and look at it from a global society, but we don't do it every year. And I know that we can't do it in 2023 because from a staffing issue and some other pieces we have in play, that's why we chose to try to go in 2021. And I know it's $3,000, but I can guarantee you, I'll get you that back in very long. And that was budgeted. But I've already pulled in for you at least 125,000 since 2019 in materials and things that otherwise we would have had to find in the budget, like the Atomatage table, like the Earth Space Science table. Wait till you, we can show that to the board. We've saved money and not putting Promethean boards in an old technology. We found a new way to do Apple TVs. We found a new way to do some of the uh, updated, um, not iPads, but the. It's, I'm not a tech person, but it's like some of the stuff that they're doing in the civil engineering and the architecture and some of the new stuff that's coming in the, the VexBot robot stuff is just fascinating. I mean, if I look at it, I don't even know if I would have gotten out of high school. Like, I look at what Ag's doing, like at our meeting, when you look at high level stuff that these kids are doing, it's just fascinating. Where you're watching kindergartners sitting there coding and laying on the floor in the library. And then they're designing literary books and graphic novels in the middle of ninth grade English class. You know, it's just, it's phenomenal what these kids can do. And we've got to stop selling all students short, whether I have an IQ of 65 or an IQ of 140. Our career academy kids, their business is taking off. Like they're making stuff, they're selling it, they're doing fractions, they're counting math. And these kids, some of these students were six months ago were nonverbal, could not speak could not do math, could not even write. 
and now we're doing numbers, keeping their books, doing quick books, selling stuff, coming in, walking up, making eye contact, shaking their hand. Like it's incredible what's happening across this district. And part of it is we need to celebrate what the staff, what the students are doing, what this community has supported. And, and this is an opportunity that we have afforded of all of Berks County, we are going in the, even the Tri-County area. And I get it's $3,000. And we're gonna take all of the trinkets and all the garb we can and hand out Holy Valley all over to anybody who will take it. Because we need to celebrate what the sister has done and what this community stands for. And it's and agriculture is great, but agriculture is also top science. And this, and this community stands for so much more than just agriculture. And these kids deserve to be recognized as well as the great work of staff and the, and the administrators do. And that's why we applied and we didn't think we had a chance coming from a rural area with limited resources. And then we got it. And that's why we were so excited. And that's why we did it. So I made it to your vote. Yeah, I get it for a lot of money. And the other thing I wanted to clarify, we don't have science Olympia, not because it's a thousand dollars. We don't have anybody who wants to go. We don't have any teacher who wants to advise it. If we had somebody who wanted to do it, I'm working on getting a parent to do it for next year. I have somebody who's gonna do World Quest for next year. So that's gonna come back on the table. We've actually volunteered to do it. So that won't cost you any money either, unless they make nationals, then you have to pay for that. But that's worth finding the money for. Um, so we're trying to get some of the stuff back in, but for what you'll get out of it, we'll easily pick that up and grant money without any problem. But it's about the future and where you're going and trying to get that life beyond Pennsylvania and get the life beyond the United States and networking. And anybody who's in the business world knows that networking is really where the future is. So, so summarize. So you like it. That was your five minutes. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> five minutes. I didn't set my timer. Curriculum is <laughs> that education is what we, we are about. It's opportunities for better lives for kids. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't present those questions that, that. And we yeah. just need to. And that's that's the passion. I, no, I mean, it's that's, good for it's good for the community to hear the good reasons. Time. It's not it's like you know. Help. I'm I, I had no that's, idea. That's just who right. I am. I mean, if right. I was, and if I'm I was sure if many people exactly sitting here had no idea either. <laughs> I don't mean that. I sent you passion. Sent your passion. No, I it. It is. I sent passion. So, and I'm not necessarily against it. I just, you know, constituents so, reach out. I, yeah, I, I want a little well, transfer. It's just hard to explain in an email. That's all. Well, now you, you got it covered. So. Yeah, I think you covered it. Well, I, I appreciate the, the level of enthusiasm and passion and everything else. And this is, this is excellent for us to hear. But from a transparency standpoint, the one thing I would ask, if these individuals could come before the board, August, September, October, sometime there, to give us an update, yeah, at, at least what did they learn? I mean, from a business standpoint, I know what I had to go through to go to an international conference and like to get approval. And when I came back within 30 days, I had have a report to management, and that was part of the deal. I, I think here, we have to set more of those, those requirements yeah, that you go on a trip like that, even if it's just an interim report, I'd say by September, what's your interim report? What did they learn? What what potentials do, do we have to apply in the Olney Valley? Mm -hmm. And you're right about skills, all the jobs, everything else. So again, I would suggest if we can do that uh, September time frame, I think that would be good for all of us to hear a, a report like that. Something like implementation plan going yeah. forward. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We write all that. The I mean, I have and all of that. The yeah. 2019 one I have. I mean, it's just. The world we struggle is like, how much do you want? Because then the meetings get too long, and then like I, we have no problem talking about curriculum. You know that. Oh, Maria likes long meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but so should we vote? Oh, so. Yeah. So, sure. so Heckman, Mr. Heckman moved on. I forget. I forget who the second was. I have Jackson. Miss Jackson. Okay, my bad. Harry. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Zakin. Yes. Piper. Yes. Backhead. Yes. Heckman. Yes. Jackson. Zach, um, Jackson. Sorry. Yes. Keller. Yes. Barkley. Yes. Thank you. Motion approved. And our next meeting is scheduled for March 7th, and that's all I have for personnel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heckman. I'm moving on to policy, Dr. Zakin. Yeah. We've got nothing tonight. Zakin, I'm uh, next, <laughs> next meeting date is March 7th. Thank you, Dr. Fatkin. Questions? Do any questions? So if there's yeah, if we if anybody comes up like changing the wording or anything, how can the changes to uh, uh, can be submitted? 
Again, I think Dr. Shank pointed out last time, these are, or, and, and Mr. Mancuso, these are actually brand new written policies. It's not like they took the old ones and are just modifying them. But, so but the, that, the track that's changes. Not, that's not what I was asking. Like if people go to view the policies and they have like, okay, this warning. You know, there's, there's no way to, there's really no way to compare except for visually comparing it. They're completely different documents. So there's, there's no track changes. If you want to change the sentence to another sentence, then they need to bring it to committee and ask the committee to change this word to this oh, word. That and then the committee decides whether or not they want to change this to that. Okay. So it's all done in committee because then you have to have five board members say we want to change the word the to that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Mark. What, That's right, Mom. I misunderstood that. Paul. Thank you for straightening me out. Uh, curriculum, Dr. Markley. Thank you, Mr. President. I have three motions for action this evening. I'd like to take all three together, unless someone would like me to pull out one of three. Any objections? Dr. Markley moves the motions one, two, and three as listed. Mr. Keller seconds a motion. Questions or comments on those three motions? Um, you're going to start to see the 22-23 stuff coming forward. They're the, what we call the annuals. Um, a lot of the you know special ed contracts, some of the the um, pro, uh, the buildings the ground, you know preventative maintenance stuff, all that kind of stuff. If you have questions on those, please just ask me. A lot of them are just their normal stuff: how to fix this, pest control, what you know the normal. But just let me know. Any other questions? Roll call vote, please. Pollock. Yes. Zakin. Yes. Piper. Yes. Backin. Yes. Heckman. Yes. Jackson. Yes. Keller. Yes. Markley. Yes. Terry. Yes. Motion one, two, and three are approved. Next meeting day is March 7th, 2022. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Markley. Property and transportation, Ms. Piper. I'm glad to see we have more bus drivers coming <laughs> forward. <laughs> Motion to approve the following uh, van drivers for 2021-2022 school year, Vincent Duke and Jenny Hoffman. This is Piper moves a motion number one. Sir, uh, Dr. Peck can uh, second that motion. Questions or comments on those two van drivers? Yes, we'll call our voice Okay, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion approved. Next meeting date, March 7th, 2022. Thank you, Ms. Piper. Student activities, Mrs. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Um, this evening, I have three motions for action that I would like to take as listed. Mrs. Jackson moves the motions one, two, and three as listed. Mrs. Jackson seconds that motion. Questions or comments on those three motions? Okay, hearing none, roll call vote, please. Piper? Yes. Faction? Yes. Beckman? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Keller? Yes. Markley? Yes. Terry? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Backen? Yes. Motions one, two, and three are approved. Under information, our next meeting date is March 7th, 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Moving on to legislative, Mrs. Zakin. I have no action items this evening. Just a reminder that the PSBA Advocacy Day is April 27th. Monday. Thank you, Mrs. Ekin. ECIU, Mrs. Jackson again. Meeting day is tomorrow night. So our next committee, I'll fill you in what we talked about. Looking forward to it. Ag advisory, Mr. Keller. Uh, nothing but the dates listed. Uh, don't forget to make a reservation for Tuesday, March 1st at the Yellow House Hotel. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Uh, I have nothing to report on the negotiations at this time. So we'll move on to BCTC. Uh, Mr. Heckman. Again, Mr. Pollock, uh, our uh, next uh, meeting is uh, the 23rd at the West Campus and March uh, 23rd at the East Campus. Um, also, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, last time, uh, Dr. Fatkin had uh, brought up some comments, very good comments about the skills areas and the like. And we had said about the possibility of a tour of BCTC for the board uh, and some administration. Um, I, I don't think we'll be able to have a board meeting on site at the East Campus, given that the point we're at in the calendar year. But a, a tour of the East Campus is certainly uh, something that we can arrange. 
Uh, so we want to go during the day. No, number one, are people interested? Sounds like a number of people are. And if we do that, we want to do it during the day when the students are there and you see a lot of activity. Uh, or as a fallback position, we want to go in the evening. I'd love to see it during the day. I mean, I don't see it in action. So, fine. You know, put an email, just kind of like a poll of when people are available. With, right. Okay. What time of day? What possible days? I have a meeting tomorrow morning with uh, the executive director, um, uh, Dr. Stauffer, and that's the second item on my agenda to get some uh, dates from him uh, and some time schedules right. because it's a moving schedule. Your bus is moving in and out, different districts, different times, those sort of things. So why don't I come back with an email to, to the board uh, of maybe two or three potential dates and times and uh, get that distributed to everybody and see what we can do. I know schedules are difficult to get during the day, but I think that, that does give you the best opportunity to really see what's going on in the building. Mr. Heckman, I had a question and maybe you might know the answer to this, but um, do the, does BCTC, do they, um, do they survey tradespeople already out in business employers to find out where every trade that we have, culinary is, is yeah. or, or carpentry or auto repair, there's a occupational advisory committee for each of those. Uh, and there are people from the community that only Valley and, or excuse me, Berks County and beyond that participate in that, uh, that funnel information to the uh, administration, to the individual teachers and all like, uh, are, are in the building, the student built house is an excellent example. Uh, the amount of uh, supplies we've gotten from local industries and companies that are part of the uh, occupational advisory committee approach. Yeah. So that is very, very strong. Yeah. Very strong. Okay. I think that uh, there's great ways of using symptoms in, in business and uh, to get the information from the community and from these tradespeople and these right. businesses to see what they're, you know, if they, if they notice that there's something lacking in the students coming out, um, you know, some would be willing to just hire them on the spot and train them in, in, in their company, you know what I mean? So, but um, I was just curious, so yeah, great. And they Thank meet, because I serve on their early childhood and they meet twice a year. Yeah. And the judge just says, okay, what are you, what do you need? What do you look around the classroom and you say, um, are these the most up-to-date materials that are being used? What are we missing? What else should we be including with our children? It's a very, very thorough agenda that is standard for every occupation. Yeah. There. Right. I have to admit that's how I found my auto mechanic, <laughs> yeah. chairman of the, of the auto repairs uh, advisory group, and uh, excellent. And there's a comment about the, the students, like many of them will uh, take a student and train them in, in their way, but the success rate we have of students coming out of the east and west campuses is very, very, very high. Yeah. Uh, and they have the right work ethic, they're there for the right reason, especially as they go through in the end of the, the senior year. Uh, by that time, they really want to work, want to get their, their, their hands on whatever they're doing, whether it's carpentry, entrepreneurship, whatever. But uh, the, the attitude is there, success rate is there. Uh, yeah. So, But again, I think it would be very good as part of our tour. We also sit down with Dr. Stauffer for half an hour or so and just talk about the philosophy and how some things work, yeah. the input they get, uh, not locally or regionally. Uh, it's not just controlled by the state. We have a lot of autonomy within those programs. Yeah. And like I said, I'm kind of new on the sport. So, um, I mean, I have all sorts of ideas, which may already be, may already be implemented. So, I, I mean, I, I foresee, I was speaking to a young lady last week in the board meeting, and she was telling me how her son, uh, after I think one year working in the trades, is making like 2000 less than her and she's been working for the school for you know what i mean not sorry for the bad publicity but oh, right. but um you know i would love to have a kid like that come into the classroom and talk to these kids you know maybe at a middle school level or an early like maybe ninth grade tenth grade i mean uh i think there's some great kids out these younger guys making a good living and uh you know i just um uh, i think that could be inv invaluable to have them have some younger younger people come in and talk to these kids that aren't you know maybe 40 50 that maybe don't connect so well with teenagers but the, but the younger ones just coming out doing well so well our meeting next week one of the uh presentations that our board is going to have is from our, our uh, outreach personnel we have a couple of people that out outreach to school districts uh there was in the writing paper it was written up recently at uh, uh brandywine carpentry program was given in second grade and now districts are, are coming to us. What about us? What about us? Well, we do have a formal outreach program and our board needs to learn more about that. And again, mm -hmm. we're learning every day ourselves. 
what is that all about? What can we do to bring back to our district? So we have uh, increased outreach. The library here and only has already approached me about outreach and, and, and their library programs. Here I bring a high school student in, uh, a, a senior young lady doing carpentry, for instance, those sort of things, uh, a lot of possibilities. So we're getting a little bit more geared up to do that outreach. But, uh, you know, again, we're all learning. And I think it'd be a good opportunity if we meet with Dr. Stalker and discuss some of those uh, ideas that you have. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Did she also tell you she didn't want her student to go there originally? Yeah. She said she didn't want her student oh, really? to go there originally. Oh. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah. And then, yeah. And now that he's making more money. Now she's thrilled. Now she's That's thrilled. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because now he's going to take care of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm glad you know who it is because uh, oh, yeah, I, was, I would love to reach too. out to that kid and say, hey, come on in and talk to some younger. Yeah. Younger That's why I told my brother the other day, too. He's going to take care of me, too. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Heckman. Thank you. Uh, Brooks EITTCC, Mrs. Wayne. Uh, thanks, Mr. Pollock. Uh, there are five re uh, reports for January 2022 were present. Um, our next meeting is March 31st. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wei. Communications, Mrs. Perry. I have nothing for tonight. Next meeting is March 7th. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Secretary's report, Dr. Shang. <laughs> um, I have listed all of your uh, events through June 30th. Through June 30th, wow. Is there a time for the jazz fest? Saturday? Yes. Um, elementary, I think, is one. Middle school is like three, and high school is at like six. Okay. Hey, thank you, Dr. Shank. Uh, under other, I have it is reported that the Ole Valley School District completed the school nutrition program administrative assessment review the Department of Education, Food and Nutrition, and was commended for following the state regulations and the audit had no findings. Basically, that is your food service audit, which is incredibly hard to do. Um, and it was passed, passed with flying colors. That is the financial side, that is the on-site, and that is the procedure review. So that is um, congratulations to all of our food service people and uh, Barb Nussel from SOS Group who does manage your food service. Um, usually they find something because that's what audit people do, um, but they, it was no findings and they were extremely impressed about how tight the procedures and regulations are in our food service department. So congratulations to all of them for all of their hard work. And that's been very hard, especially with since um, Maria Jones's uh, retirement in June. Um, so we've been kind of like tag teaming that between Ming and her staff and then Jackie Westerfer who has taken over for, for food service. So congratulations to all of them. Do we have any unfinished business? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, we discussed this previously, residence verification. So what is the process? <coughs> I know that's uh, been brought up to the board in emails from constituents, but so what is actually the process of verifying the residents? How is handled? Um, how often do we do it? Is there is a report generated at the end of this verification? What actually is the steps? Could you walk us through? Is this for commenting or are you talking about enrollment? Enrollment. The enrollment. enrollment. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that they present uh, their residents upon enrolling into the school district, mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. Uh, and then basically, unless there's a report that there's concerns, I, I believe it just continues. Um, if there would be reports of concerns, uh, generally, it goes through the chain of command that we've discussed at previous meetings um, based on the investigation, or at least a preliminary investigation, it would come to the board to discuss, uh, and that would be in an executive session because it would be a confidential student matter. So but basically we don't have like ongoing every annually, you know, the checklist, okay. Am I not understanding how it's... So basically what happens if... if um... If Mr. Mancuso decides he's going to enroll his child tomorrow, then he needs to prove up uh, a proof of resident. He comes, he fills out the enrollment packet, and in that he has to prove that he has a driver's license with an only address and then he has two proof of residency. So it's usually a driver's license, a utility bill with his, you know, his only address in the district, 
uh, within 30 days. And then he can, he doesn't have to show a lease. He does not have to show his uh, mortgage or anything like that. There's a list that PDE gives us that has the um, list of things that you have to show. What's a PDE? A Pennsylvania Department of Education. They tell us what you can accept. So you have to have two different forms and they give you a list of like six things you can choose from. So you have to have two different forms um, that has to have your current address on it. Most people use their driver's license and a utility bill. You show those, we copy them, we put them in the file and that's what you use for your proof of residency. If we, if someone reports, like I had one today, that, um, that, that believes that you're not living there, then we have the right to um, call the landlord. Townships in, in Old Valley, unlike Muhlenberg, don't have ordinances where the landlords have to provide with us the list of who lives where. So we will call some of the landlords and they're very cooperative. We have a landlord that every time somebody changes in the property that they own, they tell us all the time who lives where and every time somebody moves in and out, they tell us. Others never can call us back or provide us with that information and they aren't required to. Um, we will call. Um, we're doing a home visit tomorrow morning on someone who we believe isn't living where they say they're living. And then I send two administrators um, that will go knock on the door and see who's actually living there. Um, we do have bus drivers who will watch who's driving up and dropping off and picking up. Um, we do call the police on welfare checks sometimes if we have concerns about that. And then the police will go. Central Burks has been great working with us. State police can be um, a little more difficult, but I understand that. They're short staffed as well and don't necessarily always get involved in residency. Um, we do require if we all, if people eat, sometimes if we have somebody who's deciding that they're going to live with grandparents or going to live with boyfriends or girlfriends or our other friends that they ha have to go to the court and they get custody orders. And then we work through our um, council as far as working with their council. And we've done that several times this year already um, that to have them have to go to a court custody agreement saying that this person is now legally have a custody agreement that they have to live with this other parent and they have to update them annually at the beginning of the year. We send a letter saying if you get your custody agreement updated. So we have you know, students living with grandparents that have to be updated. We do have some that are on what's called a 1302 where parents have basically dropped off the student at the grandparents house and took off forevermore. And we have no idea where the parents are, or they're in prison or, you know, then, and so the parents, the grandparents have just taken over and we work with the grandparents on that. We do have more homeless. We do have more foster where the, you know, children do bring the children and we take them. Um, that is becoming more prevalent on the, on the residence issue. We cannot ask immigration status. We, we, we have to take the students on homeless or foster immediately. The law does require us to take a student within five days of their coming to us for enrollment. We cannot delay enrollment waiting on paperwork any more than five school days. Um, but they don't have to produce a lease. We don't have to follow up on the lease. And then, but we do track down when we get cases where you know, that we, more than one person, because sometimes we get the battles where uh, Mr. Pollock doesn't like Mr. Mancuso today, so he's going to call us and complain that they don't live there anymore, and we get, kind of get caught between the family battle, or the neighbors who don't like each other battles, so we have to sort through that sometimes in the valley, um, and usually um, the nice thing is that um, we have our child accounting coordinator who knows everybody, and our tax collectors are phenomenal, about keeping us informed. And we do run a census report and the majority of the people do send the paperwork back as to where they, we do that every spring through the business office. Um, and the people that do send it back as far as who's living where. And then we also have what's called a STEB report and it does track the real estate transactions for the home. So we will notice that sometimes people will claim an address but we notice that the house has been sold. So that you be claiming an address that has been sold, and we notice now that on the step, what's called the step report, that that address is now under somebody else's name. So then we will start to track down. Well, why why are you using this address when it now belongs to this person's name? And then you got to justify and bring us new paperwork saying, okay, I want a, a bill that is dated within the last 15 days, a utility bill or some other form of identification, payroll stuff, something like that. So. That's kind of a process. Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can keep going. Yeah. Sure. The, the right. other thing was very disturbing to hear the amount of homeless kids. Yes, we had two more today. Oh, I felt really bad for them. They were victims. So what are we doing okay. as a community? Um, we have what we call the Lynx Emergency Fund. Um, we raise money every year for that fund. We have actually two. We have the Dot Ham Fund. 
which is a fund that we use to buy meals. Um, Doc Ham was a, a long, long time uh, cafeteria manager at the elementary school. And um, when she retired years ago, uh, we started a fund in her name. And then in that fund, we have emergency uh, fund meal money that we buy for students and um, through the cafeteria. And then we kind of like what we call bag and tag uh, meals. And then we have a links emergency fund in which we have gift cards that we purchase um, that, that we give to the families that are in need or the grandparents or whoever that they could go. Um, usually we use Target or Walmart because you can get food and you can get clothing and shoes and things. Um, and then they can go and purchase what they need for their family and the sizes. Um, we do it that way um, so that they can they can purchase things for their that they need and that, that they would like versus we buy something and it may be the wrong size or the wrong color or things. And it's it also um, we do a lot and then we have all the stuff we run at Christmas time, but we do it year round. Uh, we also work with the local churches um, as far as um, like some of the clothing banks and some of the other pieces if there's things that we can't provide um, is, is that they would need um, and more of like heating or you know fuel oil or gasoline or things like that that we can't supply as the district but um, we try to really take care of the of the basic necessities because um, if you don't have those basic needs met then you're, you're never going to learn so we really do care of that as a district we have all of those emergency funds set up and then we work through our guidance counselors to kind of make it show up so they don't need the parents or grandparents or anyone if they don't even need to have um, the students in school if somebody is struggling in the community they just need to call our guidance offices and then we just make it show up so nobody needs to know where it comes from do we do also any kind of fundraisers pardon any kind of fundraisers to uh, um, we do a lot of that in-house and with our students and right now this is our our february is our month of caring we call it we're really pushing out on our food and clothing, our clothing drive on our, um, you know, for any of the like personal necessities and food and canned goods and things like that right now. Um, and then we'll, in March, we're going to do a, a March Madness kind of thing that will actually kind of raise money to uh, do more of the um, gift card, to, to purchase gift cards and um, more of a money fundraiser, corn boilers, um, that do kind you, of thing. As far as notifying community what's going on um, in regard to those fundraisers, do we send like... We send out the school messengers and it's in the building updates that come out to the parents. So then I send it out when I usually right. send something out, like even when I send a board agenda, I was like, please bring canned goods in or I'll put it inside the newsletter or something like that. And then they just drop it off at the buildings and then we collect it there. As a suggestion, could it be like a standalone message rather than buried into something else? Yeah, we can do that. We can send it out that way. Okay. That's no problem. Yeah, um, we kind of keep that rolling because we, you know, people need stuff even in the middle of July and all they have to do is just call it. We try to run everything through guidance because we try to maintain the confidentiality. And, you know, and it, it's, a, and the other piece is that, you know, we have a lot of people who are very, a couple more things. I was so <laughs> people are, um, uh, we try to respect the fact that, that, you know, people, it's very hard for people to ask for help. So sometimes we have other people who will call right. and assist. And then, you know, we just trust people to, to be honest with us and use it for what we're what we have it for and we really haven't had a problem with it you know mm -hmm. so but a lot of people are struggling so we try to help where we can Definitely. um the thing was brought up about uh teacher evaluation by student parent do we have anything like this in place teacher or student evaluation no, no it's like students and parents evaluate the teacher or something am i today Hear it right? Yeah, I thought so. Um, no, just like ongoing, like you know, feedback from student, uh, student and parents, and how teachers are, you know, teacher evaluation. I don't think there's been any lack of feedback from these parents or these teachers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just asking. Um, we, uh, we did a parent. We just did the parent surveys that were yeah, part of that, the survey. Okay. Yeah, we, we we tried. We we do them every three years as part of our comprehensive planning. Um, and we sent them out in December and we had maybe like 20 parents actually respond to the surveys and we sent them out again in January from all the buildings to all the parents and we had almost nobody respond oh, wait, again. Like through school, they sent it out to the parents through school, through your school's accounts from all the buildings to all the parents and nobody responded again. Uh, can can it be more like email? <sighs> email the survey because <laughs> it was in their newsletters and everything because then we have to we have to use a lot of parent feedback in our conference of planning which is due this summer um and then nobody responds 
And then some of the teachers do in class, some of them will do their feedback with their students. Um, I don't think most of them will do a lot of teach. Some of them might even do teacher feedback. Most of them don't, but they do um, an end of the year feedback. I know the principals do with their teachers, but when we do parents feedback as buildings and send it out to the district, we get no, nobody responds. So. Suggestion, maybe send in the email rather than through school. Yeah, they send it through everything through school G because they're trying to keep it. The state requires us through those um, the school climate surveys for the comprehensive plan. They have to keep it combined to parents. And when we try to do one on on Facebook, then it was sent to everybody on no, the no, no, no. and like, then I'm everybody not, not social it. media. I'm talking about you know the emails that you have. Yeah, we can't control. <laughs> you have to lock it to only having parents respond, which is why we use your school G. One of the requirements of the comprehensive plan, it can't be at all. And is the it, last is it, one. Is it clear on, on school? Mm -hmm. is it like it's yeah, not the link some, is right there. It's not some. Yeah, is is it eye catching? Yeah, it's just it, yeah, the link. Like, here's the link to the. Yeah, <laughs> I can have my son. <laughs> um, like little, you know what? Maybe instead of like uh, send an email suggesting to the parents, hey, could you please check your school uh, account for yeah, the. Gina did that. They, they sent the text to say, please check your email. And then, oh, yeah, that was text. Yeah, she usually sends a text that says, check your email. Who's the text high school, to? High school does. I know because I get them all. So. But not middle school. I'd have to ask him. I don't know. Yeah, because if you have not. I can have him resend it again for the third time. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we've done anything with it that's on our do list. So, and the, you brought up that Science Olympiad, uh, there was no... Uh, we have no advisors. Nobody wants to do it. Our kids and students interested here at the high school, but we didn't have any advisors. Nobody wanted to do what, the advisor. What's entitled to have an advisor? Um, the advisor, would they have to do after school practices. They have to repair the teams. The teams compete then at, um, I think it's Kutztown University. It's an all-day Saturday competition. Um, there is, it's, they, but they have to get, it takes good, probably six weeks or so. They have a club that runs. Um, we have a teacher who runs the club, but they only meet like once a month. Um, but Science Olympiad is a is a like a formal program, much like uh, Connects and some of the others. It's just so really it's a science competition. So who could be the advisor? Um, anybody with a strong science background. I'd have to really look at what the new Science Olympiad requirements are. It used to be very chemistry heavy. One more I remember, I had to look at it. No, it came up. Some of our students were looking at trying to get it started, and we couldn't find an advisor. Is it possible to put maybe like uh, you're going to look what re what's required, and also put out to the community uh, what the time commitment is going to be? Um, you know, something more. They can for next year. It's over for this year. We I understand, but uh, going forward, learn from mistakes. I well, you know the things that we could do better. They get, I can talk to OBA about it. Yeah, it's usually a teacher position because of the of the chemistry and all the other science pieces and the equipment and all that other stuff that goes into it. Right, and also like what the time requirement would be from so people actually know exactly what's what's called for. You suggest maybe some community volunteers to run it. Um, I'm I'm just asking what can be done to actually have this science Olympian for next time. So people that would be the advisors, their time commitment or are their volunteers allow or how this happens. So we need a little bit more understanding to spread the word around. Dr. Shank, is that still on co-curricular? It's not on co-curricular because it's so have... we brought back on the co-curricular schedule with time and responsibility. Yeah, it, I mean it's it's really only about a thousand dollars. It would but just it's not be not on that right now. No. Okay. It would be a one year only non rec non precedent setting. Okay, because I can assure you that every administrator since I left spent hours and hours of begging, placating people to take these positions for our kids. So the point where the principal says, I'll take four of them, mm -hmm. that doesn't take any pay. Right. Because we have done that many times. Because it is so difficult to get mm -hmm. people to do these things, and our kids want to do them. That's why it may not just take a science person. It may take someone who just loves kids to be there. And the kids usually, like like we did uh, with Mr. Small and yeah. WorldQuest, World 
those kids directed Mr. Small. Yeah. And he loved them dearly and he took them and they just were mm -hmm. together and year after year after year after year. And then when you lose someone like that, it's hard to get people to buy in again. So anybody out there sitting right now, if you really have that desire, please, when the time comes, let us know. Mm -hmm. And we will certainly interview you through the correct process. Well, it's like right now we have we have no middle school softball, I have no middle school baseball, and if we don't find anybody in three weeks, we have no middle school. Very good. Because nobody wants to coach. And then we have no student council advisors this year. We have, so we have no student Get council. Down that so we've been doing all the dances. All right. We almost had to cancel the winter formal for Friday night because I had two chaperones, which were or three chaperones. That's another, that's another fun. That was Bill, Gina, and me. <laughs> You know, so we had no, and you can't run a dance with three chaperones. No, that, was, that was one of the hardest jobs to get chaperones. Yep, Absolutely you can. hardest job. And the science stuff is all experiments. And so you got to watch, you know, uh, you got to be able to handle all of the rest of it. I but, think uh, it needs to be communicated better to the community. Those needs and shortage and, you know, even if it's the last minute. So because just a lot of people are not aware, really. Something gets canceled on Friday, can people volunteer at the last minute? Or like, you know, well, I guess we can't the last minute because you need to plan for the event. But still, just to have a better communication to what the needs are so they could be met. Well, there's other things too that have to be, you have to look out for, including clearances and everything else. Right. Involved. So right. you have to be very careful about, you know, absolutely. You can't just say, you know, it's. You have to go through the clearance process and whatever. Yeah. But at least pull out, put the call out to the community. Please get your clearances because we do need some chaperones, volunteers going forward. Well, within the district, we had a practice for many, many years to have parent coaches for programs like Odyssey the Mind. Mm -hmm. For probably 10 or 12 years, we had teams, elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, some that went for world competition uh, in Odyssey the Mind. And we did have an individual, a teacher, who was the coordinator for that. But we at one point in time, we probably had eight to 10 teams between the different levels. My wife was very, very involved in that. Uh, a lot of other people, uh, former board members were very involved, but that was all volunteers that were, but it's difficult with parents and like to have the time because it was uh, probably a you know 10 to 12 hour a week commitment to, to run for all that plus weekends, everything else. But, and it's a different world today, but we did have a, a programs where we did run with volunteers. Would be nothing new, but hopefully we can find some intelligent people who really want to step up and help, help the students. Just Great. getting the commitment. Yeah. Because if you make the commitment, sure. you, with kids, you got to follow through. Right. You got to be here. Any other unfinished business? Any new business? I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Mr. Eckman so moves. Mm -hmm. Dr. Markley emphatically seconds. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anybody want to stick around? See you next week, folks.